right, we're at the top of the hour and we're going to go ahead and dive right in. Welcome to this week's episode of Net DevOps Live. My name is Hank Preston and I will be your presenter today for exploring the ACI networking plugin for Kubernetes. Joining us on today's call is Mr. DevOps himself, Julio Gomez, and he'll be handling all of your questions that come in through the Q&A panel, so feel free to use that. As always, the resources for this presentation, including the slides, code samples, links to learning labs, and so much more are all available up on NetDevOps Live in the webinar resources se section for this episode. So with that, let's dive right in. So what are we gonna cover today? We're gonna to start out with kind of a look at some really basics, fundamental elements of Kubernetes. So what exactly is Kubernetes? We'll talk through some of the key objects, things like deployments and pods and services, and how they relate to um, deploying microservice applications in Kubernetes. And then we'll spend a little bit of time kind of on the background on how networking fits into Kubernetes infrastructure, which will lead us into the discussion about ACI plus Kubernetes. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time in slides exploring kind of what we get when we do this integration, a bit on how the fundamentals and the, and the pieces and then they work. And then we're going to spend a good chunk of our presentation today in, an, in a live demonstration of this integration. We'll see the visibility that we get within ACI from Kubernetes. We'll see how we can deploy applications, how we can work with those applications, and then even align policy around our application architectures off to our actual security policies deployed inside of Kubernetes as it goes through. So Kubernetes basics. And so Kubernetes is a container orchestration system. So before we talk about Kubernetes itself, let's hit some of the fundamentals of container orchestration, kind of what exactly does an orchestration system for containers offer and why do we need one? And so container orchestration is, is all about organizing the different hosts that you might use to um, act as kind of the, the location to run your containers. And so these would be your container worker nodes. Um, it's often easy to do a corollary off to the land of x86 virtualization and systems like VMware and vSphere that are there. And so you can think about inside of uh, VMware, we've got a bunch of vSphere hosts. And individually working with them and managing each individual VM host can be challenging. And so we bring them together and create different kind of data center objects and cluster objects, and they're managed as a single entity from vCenter. And so container orchestration aims to do the same type of thing across your container platforms. And so once we've brought our container hosts together, we can then schedule those containers and individual containers to run across our cluster to provide resiliency, um, to provide load balancing across the uh, areas that are there. Now, container orchestration systems often do a bit more than just scheduling to have containers run on individual hosts. They also go through and make sure that those different containers can easily talk to each other and provide an integration pieces that are there. And so when we run a bunch of containers for one service, we want to make it easy for those containers to be found by other services. And so there's integration with names and discovery to make it easier for one set of containers to work with others. Um, often that's done with kind of integrations with DNS capabilities. There's scaling systems. There's, there's all sorts of pieces that container orchestration solutions can offer application developers and infrastructure engineers providing these types of solutions. And there are several different types of container orchestration systems that you can run against in addition to Kubernetes. Docker Enterprise provides container orchestration as well as the con community edition, which it gives you, gives you the kind of the individual um, no or host capability to run containers. DCOS or the data center operating system, that's the Mesosphere and Mesos project. That's another container orchestr orchestration system that's out there. So there are several different orchestrations systems for containers. But Kubernetes is the one that we're going to be talking about today. And kind of in the land of container orchestration, it does seem to be the one that's rising to the top and gaining a lot of steam across enterprises and different projects. Many solutions such as OpenShift from Red Hat actually are built on top of Kubernetes. Kubernetes as a container orchestration system kind of is built out of the Google, uh, how Google does their containers in their own data centers. And so Google Borg is the internal way that Google manages the containers that run all of their search and add and uh, different services that Google provides. And so they kind of brought what they had learned from building their internal solution and then open sourced the concepts and then it birthed itself into Kubernetes as an area that's there. And now Kubernetes is kind of maintained by the cloud native computing foundation, CNCF, that's there. 
Kubernetes as an open source project is very active and we often see new releases coming out about four times a year or every quarter or every three months as they go through. Now, as a container orchestration system, Kubernetes is tightly coupled to Docker. Docker is the actual runtime, the capability that provides the ability to kind of um, run the containers themselves. So Kubernetes doesn't give you a different container uh, runtime, it just uses Docker. So one of the first steps to installing or setting up a new Kubernetes cluster is actually to install Docker on the different nodes that are there. What Kubernetes adds is kind of this orchestration, this intelligence later to describe what you want to run inside your orchestra or inside of your uh, container cluster and how they different how they relate to each other. Now, a Kubernetes architecture is made up of several different nodes that go through there. You can run an entire Kubernetes cluster as a single node, and, and that's done often for development or testing or kind of individual developer usage. But when run for an actual purpose to, to host applications and something other than just kind of testing or, or um, experimentation or learning, you'll often have multiple nodes that go through. There are two main categories of nodes that you'll walk into. There's the master nodes. And in a uh, production deployment, you'll often have multiple master nodes, at least, uh, at least three. Oftentimes, you'll see them deployed in these odd numbers um, as part of kind of a higher level resiliency that goes through. But you'll need at least one master node for a cluster to go through. The master node loosely correlates back to something like a vCenter. If we go back to our analogy from x86 virtualization, it's the organization, it's the management plane across Kubernetes. And then you'll have one or more worker nodes. The worker nodes are what actually run the end, the, the end containers, the end things, and we're going to refer to them as pods inside of Kubernetes. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. But it's the worker nodes that actually do all of the, the running of the application services that are being deployed across our cluster that go through there. Inside of Kubernetes, inside of the master, there are different kind of components that handle kind of storing of configuration details and addressing DNS pieces. But at its fundamentals, just rec remember that there's master nodes. There's going to be a few of those. They maintain kind of the management plane state of our cluster. And then some number of worker nodes that allow us to run actual applications as they go through. Now, if we look at the master node a little bit more, right? This is where the user, the uh, the developer, the infrastructure uh, management team. This is the the main component that we're going to interact with. And there are different ways to communicate and send commands off to a master node. Kubernetes is often used by end users through a CLI. So there's a kubectl or kubectl. There's different ways to pronounce it, and we'll see that in the demonstration. That's an, the mo probably the most common way that people interact with Kubernetes. Um, through the master nodes. There is a GUI, a web interface that you can spawn up and bring, but that's typically just used maybe for some dashboards or quick looks, uh, quick looking at status. The vast majority of work that's done with Kubernetes is going to be done through that CLI. And then when Kubernetes is integrated with other systems, maybe in a CI CD software pipeline or grabbing information and logs for telemetry, that's where the API can come through. And so different systems can use the Kubernetes API to reach in and request information or make configuration changes. Now the worker nodes, these are out there. This is gonna be the large farm of the elements. They make up the majority of a production cluster. And these can either be virtual machines or physical servers. And they run, the, the main component of what they're running is the, the container runtime. That's gonna be Docker. And then Docker is managed by Kubelet, which is a little service that's gonna run on each Kubernetes worker node that stays in communication with the Kubernetes master. So each that node knows what types of workloads, what types of containers it should be running, how they should be configured, and keeping that worker node in sync with what's going through. There's also an element called kube proxy, which is how we get in and out of the Kubernetes cluster um, for external uh, users and those types of communications that go through there. And so the worker nodes, again, lots of them, they're going to be running our actual workloads that are out there. Now I want to walk through some of the key objects that you need, you should be familiar with as you're diving into working with Kubernetes with ACI or with any other networking um, CNI plugin that's there as we go through. And so it starts out for me when I describe Kubernetes objects with the, the deployment object. And so a deployment will loosely refer back to kind of a single microservice that's there. And so if we think about a modern application today, it's often made up of many different microservices. There'll be a data service, maybe an API layer, a web UI, these types of different services, microservices make up our entire application. 
And so we correlate that microservice into Kubernetes as a deployment. And then the deployment will then spawn off um, or individual pods. And so a pod is an instantiation of what it takes to make up a deployment. And that's often a container. It may be more than one container, depending on the type of microservice it is. But oftentimes, it'll be a single container that is a pod. And now deployment in the microservice world, we don't want just one pod for that deployment. Because what happens if that container goes down, if we have lots of um, load coming in? And so oftentimes, you'll have a deployment that has many pods that go through. And each of those pods is kind of a clone of the configuration, the specification for that microservice as defined in the deployment. And so here in the image, we can see that this single microservice, this deployment, has four pods for some resiliency that go through. Now, the next object that comes in is how do we actually gain access to that microservice? And so this is where the actual service object inside of Kubernetes comes through. So the service provides that single entry point for the deployment. And the easiest kind of analogy I always often go back to is you can think about it like a load balancer. In this case, we've got uh, um, four different pods providing access to this microservice. And so we want to provide access to it. Now, there are two different types of virtual IPs or, or IPs that get attached to that service. There's the cluster IP. Cluster IPs are used for intra-Kubernetes um, communications. So if we've got two different deployments inside of the same cluster trying to talk to each other, cluster IPs would be the virtual IP used inside of Kubernetes for those deployments, for those services to talk to each other. Now, if you've got extra Kubernetes connections and uh, users from the internet, other systems, maybe um, traditional VM style systems or bare metal solutions or, or um, different just things that are outside of the Kubernetes world and they're trying to communicate with your service, that would use an external IP. And so there'll be either, so a service can either have both a cluster and external IP or maybe just a cluster IP if that service is only used inside of Kubernetes itself. Now the next object is kind of the, actually the top level object for Kubernetes, and that's the namespace. Namespaces are organizational constructs, and so it's how we group together all of these objects. Every object inside of Kubernetes will be part of some namespace, and it's used for organization and hierarchy. Role-based access control can be linked back to namespaces. So it's a way to take a single cluster and kind of divide it up across different types of users or teams or applications. And then inside of that namespace, we can have lots of different objects. So here we've got an example of microservice two, which is made up of a separate deployment. It has some number of pods. And in this case, the service is only has a cluster IP, implying that this service, this deployment, this microservice would only be used by other Kubernetes objects that are there. So these are the fundamental objects related to kind of getting started with Kubernetes. And, and these are all gonna come up as we discuss this, the ACI plugin and the integration that goes through. Now, one other piece I wanna talk about is the Kubernetes annotation concept. And so an annotation inside of Kubernetes can be attached to any type of object. And so we can provide annotations to deployments or pods or services. And what the annotation is, is it's a bit of metadata that we can attach to that object. Now, annotations are not actually used by Kubernetes itself or Kubernetes functions that are there. They're actually used for all sorts of different plugins that can be added or tools that can be integrated into the Kubernetes environment. And so if you've got, in our example here, we're connecting into the ACI CNI plugin and we're trying to link some element of that uh, or we're trying to link an object from Kubernetes off to some part of an ACI construct, we'll use an annotation that allows us to link back. In this example, we can link this deployment to a specific tenant application profile and then EPG name. And so this deployment and pod, the pods for it can be show, uh, will be applied to a particular type of policy. And we'll see examples of this in the demo. Now, as I mentioned, the annotations are not actually used by Kubernetes itself. There's another type of um, attribute that objects can have called labels, and we see that brought up here at the top. The labels are similarly data about it. It's metadata about that object, but it's the labels type. That's what's actually used inside by Kubernetes itself. Annotations are used by all plugins and elements that are there. It's a common uh, function used by inside of Kubernetes for lots of different plugins. Now, as we come to the end of kind of the Kubernetes 101, the fundamentals of Kubernetes, I want to talk a bit about kind of the networking concepts and how networking fits into Kubernetes. 
And so one thing to recognize about Kubernetes is when you install a Kubernetes cluster, set up a cluster by default, there actually is no networking structure that's under the hood. Kubernetes doesn't ship with a default networking capability. Part of the Kubernetes project says, you know what, we want to allow networking to be this area that different users can kind of customize, integrate in with their own solutions as needed. And so Kubernetes can be consistent across all sorts of different environments, but individual owners, individual uh, enterprises or cloud solutions providing Kubernetes can kind of plug in a, a networking element as they need. And the way that these networking elements get plugged in is by using what's called the CNI or the Container Network Interface Standard, and it's over here on the right hand side of the slide. Now as Kubernetes was coming through, there were actually two different standards for how to do uh, container-based networking integration or plugins. There was the CNN, CNM, Custom Networking Driver, which was initially proposed by Docker, and then the CNI was an alternative one that was proposed by CoreOS. Now on the slide here, we're breaking down kind of uh, how they each compare to each other, and I've bolded out kind of the, the main key points to keep in mind here. So CNM supported only Docker, that's where it came from, where CNI supported multiple runtimes. And so CNI plugins can use Docker containers or LXC containers or Rocket containers, all sorts of different containers can use the same types of CNI interface, where CNM only supported Docker. And then at least somebody's opinion is that the CNIs or plugins are simple while CNM was complex. And so based on all of these, Kubernetes chose as it was building the project to leverage CNI as the model for plugins. And you can read more about that at this blog post that's uh, linked here at the bottom of the slide. Why I spent a little bit of time going through that background is when you talk about the ACI CNI plugin, this is where it comes back to is that the ACI plugin is based on the open or the standard container network interface. And so when you deploy Kubernetes, you need to choose some CNI plugin to install. And there are lots of different CNI plugins that offer different types of capabilities. Some of them are virtual uh, software-based networking only. Some of them tie back into physical infrastructure like the ACI CNI plugin does. But that CNI piece, this is where it comes from, is out of this standard for network interfaces for container networking. So let's jump in and kind of talk about this ACI plus Kubernetes capabilities that are there. And so it starts out kind of with the goal around ACI and containers. And actually it's the same goal that we've had inside of ACI since it initially launched several years ago. And the goal around application centric infrastructure is to provide consistent and unified networking for all types of workloads that you might have in your data center. And so when ACI first came out, data centers were made up very heavily of virtual machines, and then there were physical workloads that went through. And over time, we've had cloud workloads get added and containerized workloads that went through. And so keeping with that mindset of providing a single type of network and construct and configuration model across your entire networking capabilities, this is what the ACI and container integration offers, is consistent networking for our containers along with our virtual machines and physical servers. We're also trying to provide some of the, the value that physical infrastructure can give into the container and the microservice workloads. And so one of the other things we get from this ACI and container integration is integrated load balancing inside of the network across our microservices. And so we talked about the services object and cluster IPs and external IPs. Now those are elements that, those are networking elements that have to be delivered by some CNI plugin that's integrated with Kubernetes. And so when you use the ACI CNI plugin, all of that service load balancing actually happens as part of the ACI construct. And so we'll see physical um, NAT configuration done inside of the ACI fabric to represent those external IPs to provide access in. We'll see how we actually do software load balancing inside of the ACI controlled OVS or open V switch to provide the cluster IP load balancing as they go in. And then all of the tenancy and integration pieces, kind of linking the concepts of namespaces and deployments and pods between Kubernetes and then the ACI objects so that we can have consistency between network and security policies and application architectures. And one of my favorite pieces that we get out of this integration is the visibility. And it's one of the first things we're going to look at in the demonstration is how simply by integrating, even if you don't take advantage of any of the, the segmentation or the security policies that are offered through the integration, 
if you just connect the two together, we now start to see all of our containers, all of our pods that are running in the same way that we see virtual machines and physical machines. A container shows up an, as an endpoint inside of ACI alongside all the rest of the endpoints that are there. So a great amount of visibility that comes through. Now, a big part of any type of Kubernetes discussion is kind of the roles. Who owns what piece of the puzzle? Where do things happen? And so with Kubernetes and ACI, what we end up with is this ability to kind of have developers, infosec teams, and network administrators continue to maintain their workloads, their domains, be ownership and kind of, of their elements of these, but provide the linkage that's there. And so network administrators are responsible for the core networking pieces. And so this is an ACI fabric. They'll be responsible for bringing up the fabric like they always have, creating the core networking constructs like layer two bridge domains, layer three context, making sure the VLAN pools, all the stuff that you would normally do inside of the network, network administrators will do that. Developers, application owners, application developers will continue to work just like they always do with Kubernetes. They'll build their containers, they'll manage their Docker files, they'll figure out how to control the actual uh, Kubernetes clusters that are out there. They'll be responsible and, and enabled to kind of write their policies into their application definitions just like they always do with Kubernetes, no matter it's, if it's private or public, running in AWS or Google, they can manage their applications just like they have. And then we can team up with InfoSec to actually, um, when we want to take that step to integrate the application architecture to network and security policy, InfoSec can help kind of bridge that and go through application dependency mapping and then constructing the application contracts and policies and filters inside of the network. So when the time comes that you want to take advantage of that level of segmentation inside of your microservice applications, it's very seamless to do that. And we'll see that in the demonstration as we go through. Now, when we integrate ACI and Kubernetes, Kubernetes shows up like a VMM or virtual machine management domain, similar to what you would see with vSphere or Hyper-V or KVM inside of um, ACI. So Kubernetes would just shows up as a container domain inside of um, ACI, and we'll see that as well in the demo. Now, what happens here is that the network policies get configured for the application as part of the Kubernetes definitions, no different than you would configure those in any type of a Kubernetes deployment. And then the synchronization happens to make sure that the ACI policies and the network policies are aligned and connected as they go through. And so network and security administrators and engineers, they manage the policies inside of ACI. Um, application developers manage their policies inside of their Kubernetes definitions. And it's that linkage between them that the CNI plugin provides is how they go through. That CNI configuration that goes through allows us to do things like embedded policy-based routing to provide switch load balance or provide the load balancing features for the services that are deployed. And we get tons of visibility as part of that VMM domain. Inside of ACI, network and security engineers can kind of see how many nodes, how many worker nodes are actually deployed inside of this cluster. What are the services that have been created? What are the deployments that have been created? So we can map all of those objects back and forth. And we can treat, and when we have visibility into a particular running container, we actually know where did it come from? Which node is it running on? How is it running as it goes through? Because of this visibility in the side of the VMM domain. The ACI CNI plugin itself is made up of three different components that actually run inside of Kubernetes. And so there's the ACI containers controller. And so this is a single kind of deployment. This is a single pod that runs. You can scale it up for resiliency as it goes through. And this is the part that monitors the actual Kubernetes application state, what developers have deployed, what application owners have deployed to Kubernetes, and then synchronize that with ACI, create the ACI objects, things like those load balancing features, those cluster addresses as they go through, mapping together endpoints and EPGs so that they link appropriately. That's all handled by the ACI containers controller. Second, we've got the ACI containers host, and you'll see down here in the screenshot, there's actually three of these because that um, component runs on every single Kubernetes node. And this is what manages the node level configurations. It controls things like multicast and broadcast traffic as it goes through, and just make sure kind of the communication in and out of that node is done appropriately and matching up with what's needed. And then finally is ACI containers open V switch. Again, this is a component that will run on each and every one of the Kubernetes nodes and actually provides the, the networking functions for that node. 
And so it is the actual virtual switch. It's handling policy, forwarding decision, encapsulation, segmentation. All of that is done by the ACI Containers Open V switch. And again, that will run on each of the components that's there. Now, when you deploy applications to Kubernetes that are inter and that Kubernetes cluster is integrated with ACI, you have choices on how you want to handle your, your application isolation features. And there's three different broad categories. The default category is the one on the left here. It's this cluster isolation. And with cluster isolation, a single endpoint group, a single EPG inside of ACI is used for the entire cluster. Every deployment and every pod for those deployments would all show up inside of a single EPG and, ha and um, have the same security policy applied to those. There's, this has the benefit that it's immediately usable when we do this integration. And there's absolutely no changes needed on the Kubernetes developer side, application developer side, and very little that actually has to be done from the, the security or networking side. This is kind of like saying, okay, I just want a basic Kubernetes cluster and I want the networking to be done through ACI as it goes through, similar to how we do networking for our VMs and our physical servers. Now, cluster isolation, very easy to set up. It's where most people will start, but it also gives us a lot of benefits. We get the integrated load balancing, we get the visibility for our containers. So even without any of the isolation capabilities we'll see in just a second, we still get a ton of visibility that goes through. Now, moving over here to the middle to namespace isolation, this is kind of bringing us up to the next level of potential segmentation that goes through. Now, many enterprises are struggling with how, how to manage and how to configure and provide Kubernetes features to all of their different application teams and different applications that are there. Some organizations are going so far to provide every single development team, every single application team, their own independent Kubernetes cluster so that they can provide segmentation and, and control across um, for each of these teams because of some of the, the challenges with having shared clusters as they go through with applications kind of impacting each other or security concerns that go through. And so with namespace isolation, we get this ability to say, okay, let's have a single Kubernetes cluster. So we've only got one set of infrastructure that needs to be managed, but we're gonna set up namespaces to do segmentation. So maybe individual development teams get a namespace or applications get a namespace as they go through. And all of the components for that application or that development team go into the namespace. With namespace isolation, we can then inside of the network, inside of ACI, make sure that the applications that are deployed inside of a namespace are isolated from each other and only traffic that's explicitly permitted by network and security policies in the forms of contracts and filters are allowed, similar to how you would deploy contracts and filters between EPGs and a traditional type of virtual machine or physical server isolation as they go through. This does give us the ability to have that single shared infrastructure, but protect our application resources by putting all of those application resources into a single namespace that then shows up in a single EPG. Now, moving along farther to the right, we come to deployment isolation. For me, this is where we get into the concepts of kind of really um, high level segmentation or micro segmentation strategies that organizations are trying to accomplish. With deployment isolation, rather than having a single EPG for all of the deployments deployed inside of a namespace, now each and every deployment can actually be put into its own EPG. So we can now start to say, okay, this microservice represented by this deployment needs this type of access in and out. And this type of, and, and only these other elements of our, of our application or these other external elements should be able to access the services and the pods that are there. Now, in order to do deployment isolation, you do need to have um, explicit visibility and understanding of the application architecture that's there. But that's no different than micro segmentation and segment stra segmentation strategies that have been underway in organizations for their traditional applications, even without this type of um, application pieces that are there. Now, moving along, let's get into the demonstration. We've been doing slides here for about a half an hour. Let's use the rest of the time to actually see this in action. So let me go ahead and get set up. We'll start out by logging into my APIC. While I was chatting away, I timed out. So let me get my credentials here. So I'm gonna log into my ACI Fabric. Now, before I started the presentation, I've already installed Kubernetes, have a cluster running, and then done the integration with APIC because that doesn't take a terribly long amount of time, but I didn't wanna just run a bunch of automation scripts on our demo, but we'll walk through and see kind of the impact and the visibility that goes through. 
So starting here in ACI, we're going to jump over to this virtual networking area. I mentioned how when we do this integration, Kubernetes shows up as a VMM domain, but a container domain. And so we can see container domains here. If I expand this out, we can see different container structures. So ACI supports Cloud Foundry, Kubernetes, OpenShift, with additional container orchestration being added over time. We can see that there's several different Kubernetes clusters currently integrated in with this fabric. The fabric I'm using is actually the DevNet Sandbox that provides ACI Kubernetes integration. And so we've see, we can see that there's several other folks that also are doing using the Sandbox at the time. My particular Sandbox pod is Kube SBX 38. So I'll go ahead and expand that one out. And so we can see underneath here, I've got nodes and namespaces. I can expand out the nodes and see that I've got three different nodes. Now Kubo 1 is my master node, Kubo 2 and 03, these are the individual worker nodes that are part of my small cluster that's configured. I can select one of these and get some basic information about this individual node once it pops up here, there we go. I can see some of the general details about that node and I can dive into the health and look for faults that go through, similar to what you would expect for any type of object inside of ACI. I can expand out namespaces. Again, namespaces are these hierarchical objects inside of Kubernetes for, for um, organizing our, our different pieces that are there. And we can see that we've got default, kube public, kube system, and then my hero. Kube system is actually used as an internal namespace for Kubernetes. It's where the system level objects run. So I can actually take a look at this one and see that underneath here, I have a deployment running for ACI containers controller. There's the CNI plugin that's running. And then kubedns is a, is a deployment, a function that's provided by Kubernetes. So different services can find each other based on names rather than having to know these IP addresses that change really fast in a container's world. And then the My Hero namespace is actually gonna be used in part of our demo in a moment around our application style segmentation as we deploy our apps as they go through. The default namespace is created automatically and used for all of the uh, kind of the initial applications. It ties back to the cluster isolation that we talked about. So let's actually go through and look at some of the pieces uh, inside of the tenant that gets created as part of this integration. So underneath tenants, we can again see kube SBX 38. So there's my tenant that represents my cluster integration that's there. And so the way that the integration is actually done between Kubernetes and ACI is using a provided automation script called ACC provision. So it's a Python script. You download this from either cisco.com or just through pip. And then you use it to provide, you, you build a YAML file that describes your network environment, your Kubernetes environment. And then that actually bootstraps the ACI fabric with all the objects necessary for the integration creates the VMM domain pieces we looked at, and also creates this tenant and all of the related objects that will allow Kubernetes to integrate when Kubernetes is, the CNI plugin is installed. One of the things that gets created is this application profile called Kubernetes. And then inside of this application profile, we see three EPGs. And so these EPGs tie back to kind of the initial types of applications we might deploy. As I mentioned, kube system, is used for all of the internal system pieces. So if I select this, this uh, EPG and then look at the operational, wait for it to update for me here. There it goes. Look at the operational, we can see our first hint of contain, running containers showing up as endpoints. We can see kube DNS shows up right here. And so this is an actual container running inside of my cluster. I can see that it's running on SBX uh, or kube 03, so that worker node, and some of the information that comes through. If I go back and I take a look over here, I'm gonna switch from ACI for a moment into a terminal window and use the kubectl command to take a look at some of the application pieces that are running right now. And so if I do a git deployments, we'll see that prior to starting the demonstration, I went ahead and installed a sample application. It's the My Hero application. It's a learning application that I built to allow uh, discussions around microservices. And so it's this multi microservice web application that allows us to vote for, allows you to kind of view and vote for different superheroes. And I've deployed this into my cluster. Now, the way that you deploy applications into Kubernetes is using definition files. And so if I take a look here, so this here is an app is the actual application definition for one of the deployments um, and applications that are there. So we're going to look at this one here. It's this My Hero Data application. 
And so inside of this single YAML file, we're actually defining both the service, so the load balancing feature for this application, as well as the deployment, the actual kind of container details that are there. Starting with the container details, if we just look at some of the key components, we can see that here's the image file, the Docker image that's going to be run. We can see the port that this application runs on, which is port 5000, and it's an HTTP based application. And then we can see some environment pieces. What's important to recognize here is this data file, this definition file is the exact same Kubernetes definition file that I use when I deploy this application to the public cloud inside of AWS or Google using Kubernetes. So the first step here to run my application is I didn't as an application developer really need to change anything. I could use the exact same application definitions and then go ahead and apply them to my cluster. And that's what we did here to make these run. And so if we take a look here, so those are the deployments. And remember, deployments are made up of some number of pods. And so if I do kubectl get pods, we'll see that I've got several running pods that are here. I have three instances of the app deployment that goes through providing the API and the kind of the API interface. There's a single instance of data, Ernst, and Mosca. Those are kind of underlying data and queuing components of the application. And then there are two instances of the UI that are running here. And so this again was deployed with no changes. This is kind of using that cluster isolation. And so if I flip back over to APIC, we should be able to find those running containers inside of kube default, which is the, the EPG that's automatically created for just kind of default cluster isolation. And as you would expect, based on that description, when I look at the operational views for this kube default EPG, I see each and individual one of the endpoints, each running container for this entire application shows up. I get visibility to the IP address that was assigned by Kubernetes by the CNI plugin for ACI to those running pods. The way that Kubernetes works is every, every container that runs is assigned an IP address to go through. I can see which hosting server they're running on. So we'll see some of these are on Kubo2, others are on Kubo3. Those are the worker nodes that are available. The reporting controller is the linkage, which ACI or which uh, Kubernetes cluster are, is reporting this. In this case, this is kubesbx38. And I can even see the interfaces where this is coming in from and finally reaching into the fabric. So this does come into the fabric through Ethernet 1.4 off of node 101. We can also see that it's actually coming in encapsulated. So which tunnel interface is it coming through? And then the actual VXLAN encapsulation. That encapsulation is happening inside of the Kubernetes node by the CNI controlled OVS. And so we're extending our ACI fabric from the physical network all the way into the virtual network running inside of Kubernetes that goes through. And so let's actually see if this application is working. So I'm gonna do a kubectl get services. And remember services, this is the load balancing feature that goes through. And so we can see two of these services have external IPs assigned. The My Hero app service has an external IP assigned because we provide API access to the outside world. That's how part of this application works is you can consume this application via API. And so this is exposed with an external IP address. And then My Hero UI also has an external IP address so that external users can use this application. Now you would likely tie this back in with some sort of DNS service in a production type of environment, but I'm gonna go ahead and copy that IP address and see if I can reach my application from my local environment here. And so HTTP and then put in the IP address. This brings up the application. And as I mentioned, it's a very simple, just demonstration application that lets us vote for our favorite superheroes. Uh, we'll go ahead and vote for Spider-Man. He's always been a big fan of mine, or uh, I've always been a big fan of his and we can see the results that are here. This is, this is showing kind of that as it goes in. And so what we're hitting is we're hitting one of the, um, the running My Hero UI pods. So if I go back again, right, we've got two different My Hero UI pods that go through. They're being load balanced through Kubernetes inside of this service that goes in. And we can see, waiting for my mouse to come back. Oh Lord. There we go. So we've got our My Hero UI service We've got cluster IP for internal access and then external IP. Now Kubernetes does all of this kind of integration by using the CNI plugin. And so let's see how this, this load balancing is actually being done through the ACI fabric. 
So I'll switch back over here and we'll take a look at the ACI fabric. Now, all of the, the load balancing functions are gonna tie back into different networking policies that go through. And so in my fabric here, we're actually using a single physical fabric for multiple pods, multiple sandbox pods. And so that external access into the fabric is all done from the common tenant. So I'm jumping over to the common tenant and then we're gonna take a look at kind of the layer three out because this is where we start to, we'll, we'll see our initial hints of the load balancing that's there. So under my external routed network, I have this layer three out called sandbox shared L3 out. I configured this when we set up the, the ACI fabric, just like I would configure any layer three out to integrate my ACI fabric with the outside world. What happens with the ACI CNI plugin is that it will dynamically create new network objects to represent these external IP addresses, these load balance, uh, load balance objects that are coming in from Kubernetes. And so down here at the bottom, we can see kube SBX 38, two entries, one for My Hero app and another one for My Hero UI. And these represent the actual load balance object um, that was dynamically created by the CNI plugin. And so if I go and look, we'll see here we're 172, 20, 38, 202, and 203. Those IP addresses should match what's reported here. And indeed we do, 172, 20, 38, 202 and 172, 20, 38, 203. And so when the traffic comes in from my local workstation, so I'm just accessing that web page from my Mac, the first hop is the, the layer three out coming into the ACI fabric, and we can see that we've got these network addresses or these, um, these external networks that are created. Now where this comes through is because the layer four through seven kind of automatic features that come through the, the service insertion, the policy-based routing that ACI provides is being managed automatically by the ACI CNI plugin. And so another area where we'll see that is if I drill down here, we can see inside of, again, services, layer four through seven, layer four through seven uh, service graph templates, we'll see that we've got these objects, these templates that have been created. And now I'm not gonna go through every piece that's in here because layer four through seven and service insertion is a pretty advanced topic for ACI. And I understand fundamentals, but I know for a fact I could never have created these objects manually by hand if I had to do this for each and every service that was created. That's part of the value that the CNI plugin gives us is by doing this automatic integration for us so that we don't have to know all of the pieces that are necessary because that can be a bit challenging. So ACI CNI plugin is monitoring the, the Kubernetes behavior that's needed, that what's been requested, and then taking advantage of the objects that are available to do this integration automatically for us. Now we've seen the external IP addresses. Um, one quick area where we can actually see some of the internal IP addresses that go through are here. So there's two sides to the, to the natty necessary for these services. The first piece is that external IP address natting that goes through. We saw how that happens kind of at the edge at the layer three out. What that happens at that point is the traffic hits the edge device, hits the, the border leaf that's controlling that layer three um, out configuration for ACI. And then it actually nats it back, tunnels it to whichever one of the worker nodes, whichever node inside of Kubernetes is running those actual applications. And so right here, this device integration, we can actually see where, we're, where Kubernetes, the OVS switches, the endpoints actually show up as mapped layer four through seven devices for this integration that goes in. And so we have the ability to see how those go in. Each one of these devices represents uh, one of our, work, our running nodes that are in there. Now, one other thing I wanna point out is, is we get, uh, we've seen the visibility. So let me jump back over here to our tenant and we're gonna expand back out our Kubernetes and we will take a look here at kube default. And so we can see again, we've got our operational view of all of our apps. But one of the challenges that we have with this cluster isolation that's used by default is every single application that would want to be deployed into this cluster will ha would end up in the exact same EPG and have the exact same policies. And so one of the risks that come up is what if there's uh, somebody deploys an application that has a problem or there's an issue that goes through. And so let's simulate some of that as it goes in. So I'm actually gonna go through and I'm gonna start another interactive uh, application. So I'm gonna use kubectl and I'm gonna use this right here. So we'll walk, look at this command real quick. So kubectl n default. So in the, uh, the default namespace, which is what we're gonna use, I'm gonna say run 
an interactive and then give me a TTY connection. So basically let me type at a terminal and I'm calling this new pod, this new application Trojan app. So we're simulating, there's another application that's deployed to our cluster, um, but it has a, some problem, either accidentally or maybe a malicious application that goes through. And so now I'm running, I'm actually here, my prompt changed, and we can see I'm on my Trojan app container as it goes in. So I've started a new interactive pod. I can see glimpses of that if I come back over here and I just refresh the operational view from Kube default. Where is it? I'll refresh it and down here at the bottom, we can now see that Trojan app is now also running alongside my actual application that goes through. Now, because it's in the same EPG, it has the same policies from this Trojan app, I have the ability to reach out and work with that production application that's there. So I can do things like send a curl request off to my hero data and then say, give me the options that come back. And so again, My Hero Data, that's the data service for this application. It provides a REST API. I send this away and oop, I get an error message. So this, this method requires an authorization key, but I've been able to reach out and touch that as it goes through. If I, was, uh, if I knew what the authorization key was, or if I just wanted to kind of poke at it for a little bit, I could continue my exploration on this one and send some, some different keys. In this case, I'll send the actual one, secure data. And so now from Trojan app, I've been able to reach in and manipulate and work and, and send traffic against an actual production application. So this is a concern about cluster isolation as it goes in. We're, sometimes we, have, we're, we don't want that, right? We wanna isolate, we wanna have some segmentation as they go through, which is where we're gonna go to our next bit of this demo, which is how can we start to then take advantage of the application policies from ACI and map these into our Kubernetes applications that are there? And so right here, we've got a simple example of what the application architecture looks like. And so I've got my users, we've got a web presentation layer, the web or the UI layer should be able to talk to the application layer, the application layer should be able to talk to the data layer, right? A fairly typical, in this case, this is a simplified version of the architecture, but we've got a simple, uh, kind of an example of how the architecture might look. What we want to do is we actually want to replicate that type of architecture inside of ACI. And so I prepared this already. So the idea here is that the application team would sit down with the network and security teams and they would go ahead and they would build an application profile and then EPGs representing each of the tiers of this application and then construct the, the, the application policy, the ACI policy to match and mimic what's there. And so what I've got, I'm gonna try to expand this out so it can be seen. And so up here, we've got all of our endpoint groups, our EPGs, and then we can see the contracts that go in. Now, some of these, I'll move them out of the way. The, the health check is just a standard uh, one that provides health checking, but we can see the containers, the app. Let me get these kind of organized so we can see them a bit better. Data, uh, layer three out, that's close enough. All right, so we can see the traffic comes in through the UI. The UI is then allowed to talk to the application tier. The application tier can talk to the, the queuing tier and the data tier and then go through in there. And so we've prepared, we've built out our policies, we've got our EPGs that are deployed here. And so now we say, okay, let's deploy our production applications and then align our security and our application policy to that. And so we can go ahead and take a look at how that would work. And so the way that that works is, let me get rid of that is through the addition of an annotation. Now remember inside of our discussion when we were talking through the slides, we talked about annotations. And so this is the area where we start to say, okay, let's actually add some, some metadata, some information to our deployment. So in this case, we can see that I've got metadata for name, my hero data. We have an annotation that says, okay, opflex.cisco.com endpoint group. So that's the key. That's what uh, the ACI CNI plugin is going to look for. And then the value of this is just a simple kind of JSON blob that describes which tenant, application profile, and then actual endpoint group that any pod inside of this deployment should then be put into. And now, so we don't have to specify all of the actual um, communication paths inside of the Kubernetes definition. We just set that up inside of ACI and then just link our deployments to the endpoint groups. So the communication goes through in there. And again, the use of annotations for this type of a feature is something that's common for Kubernetes. And so let's go ahead and redeploy our application using the deployment isolation method that's there. So to do that, I'm gonna come over here 
and I'm going to first uninstall the other application. So I've got a, a quick script here that will just go ahead and uninstall all my applications. And so pull off the old cluster isolation version of this application. It'll take just a second. And this script is just running a whole bunch of kubectl commands to delete and remove these different components. All right, those are done. And so if I change into CD into um, deployment isolation, what you'll see is I've got templates here for each and every one of the, the, the definition files for the application that's there. And I've got an install script. What the install script is going to do is ask me which pod number I'm in. And again, I'm in pod 38. And then it will go ahead and update all of those annotations so that this application will be deployed to the appropriate tenant that's in there. So I'll run my My Hero install script. I'll tell it I'm in pod 38. And it goes ahead and runs this as a way. So now when I come back over, we'll do a kubectl n. We deployed this application into the My Hero namespace and then get pods. We should see that, okay, almost all of them are running. We're still waiting on one last one. There, now they're all running. If I do a kubectl n get services, uh, my hero gets services. So again, I'm specifying which namespace because I've now moved this into a different namespace. There's my UI, so I can go ahead and grab this guy. And then change to a new address, not S. So now I'm again accessing my application, but now it's been deployed in LinkedIn and I can still vote. In this case, we'll vote for Captain America. And so when I now look over here, the application wasn't deployed to default. If I looked in, if I look in kube default, these should all be gone. Again, we deleted that version of it. But now when I look underneath the My Hero application profile and then the EPG for My Hero UI, we see that I've got the UI endpoint is running. If I switch over to app, we'll see that I've got the app UI that's running. And so now we've actually put our contracts in place. So let's end our demonstration here because we are just about done. I'm doing pretty well on time. And I'm going to re-simulate that, um, that access. I'm going to go ahead and open up a, an interactive connection to a different terminal. So let me grab what I need for that. And so this time, when I actually deploy it, I'm going to simulate a UI service that's been then has been compromised, that's been owned, that goes through. And I'm going to do that by actually deploying it with the same types of annotations that we need for a UI service. And so this is again, I'm running the kubectl run command. I'm deploying it into the my hero namespace. In this case, we're going to call it pond UI. So it's simulating a UI server that's been um, compromised. And then here, this annotation is how we actually make sure it shows up in the appropriate place. So again, opflexcisco.com, kubesbx38, the My Hero application profile, and My Hero UI. And so if I switch back, we should now see our, there it is, pond UI. So we've now see, we've simulated a broken in version of that. And so from Pond UI, now this is a UI service. So I should be able to access the app service. So if I do a curl dash H, we'll put the proper key in just so that it works. Secure app, my hero app options. So I can hit the app service that's there. Now I've, that's part of the, just kind of the application. If we lose a UI service, that UI terminal has access to what it's supposed to have access to. But if I change and try to access from this UI service off to the data service, I could let this sit. Eventually this will time out because the pond UI doesn't have access to the data service. So I'll quit that and then just show that if we were to, I will exit out again. So I've killed that pond UI. Now I'm going to rerun it, but I'm going to move it instead of being in the UI uh, endpoint group. We'll put it in the app endpoint group just to show how that contract actually is getting applied appropriately. So now I've moved moved it over. If I come back, now I look in my hero app. We'll see that it's here. Pond UI is now showing up. And now if I try to run that curl command for data, oop, I gave it the wrong key. We'll just put the correct security key in there, secure data. We'll see that now from the app 
con the app EPG where or the app um, EPG, the app type of an application, I'm able to access the data as you would expect as it goes through. This is the importance of having segmentation and being able to apply your application architectures and match that to your actual security and network architecture that's there. Wow. Time flew. We got five minutes left. Let's go ahead and actually return to our slides and finish up kind of where we're at. So in summary, what did we go through? So across today's technical talk, we started out with kind of the fundamentals of Kubernetes. We talked about the basics, what are the objects that are there, kind of how networking works with the plugins. We described the ACI CNI plugin, what it provides to us and a little bit on how it works. And then we did a demonstration, the visibility capabilities, the segmentation options that the ACI CNI plugin as it goes through. Now, if you're interested to learn more, because again, there's only so much we can cover in a single 60 minute workstation or work, um, technical talk, we've pulled together a lot of resources. And so starting out with, I wanna point out to some brand new learning labs that are available up on DevNet, freshly launched. And so all of the workflow necessary to, to install and configure a Kubernetes cluster, do an integration with the CNI plugin, including exploring all of the different application deployment op options from cluster to namespace to deployment isolation, this new learning track, exploring the ACI CNI plugin for Kubernetes, is live and available on DevNet today. If you want to learn a little bit more about DevOps and kind of Kubernetes in general application architectures, check out the DevOps 101 labs that are also available there. Now, if you're wondering, those are great labs, but I don't have a Kubernetes and ACI fabric to work with. Well, you're in luck. As you saw, I was taking advantage of the ACI Kubernetes sandbox, the learning labs, all the sample code necessary to kind of replicate all of the demos that I ran through, they're available as well. So you can jump in and reserve one of our sandboxes and then check out the code samples that are there. Now, as typical, right, I want to end with a code exchange challenge, and this is an interesting one. So what I'm looking for is go ahead and see if you can deploy a sample application to Kubernetes and ACI, reserve one of our sandboxes, get it set up, and then deploy some sample application, and then figure out how you could build the application definition to match the application architecture to ACI. If you need some sample Kubernetes applications, the Kubernetes, or, um, the Kubernetes organization on GitHub has an examples repo that has some places that you can get started. Now, if you're looking for more about general Net DevOps topics, be sure to join all or take take a look at all the Net DevOps pages and resources available up on DevNet, from the homepage at slash Net DevOps to all of the Net DevOps live resources and webinars and tech talks that are available there. If you have more questions on this, please be sure to stay in touch. You can follow me up on Twitter at HF Preston. You can reach out to me over WebEx Teams or email at hapresto at cisco.com, and be sure to follow Cisco DevNet. And then as always, thank you so much for joining today's technical talk. Be sure to follow at NetDevOps Live on Twitter for all of the latest information, as well as all links to the videos for all of our technical talks and information as we start to plan out next season's uh, uh, roster for NetDevOps Live tech talks and other resources. With that, thank you so much for joining and we'll see you next time.